Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Uh, thank you all for coming. Unfortunately, Joe Groom, my co-coordinator, is ill today and was due to introduce. Um, but instead, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Peter Doherty, not the lead singer of the Libertines and Baby Shambles, responsible for post-punk revival, but instead one of Australia's 15 Nobel Prize winners. Peter, along with colleague Rolf, Zink Rolf Zinkenagel, discovered one of the central mechanisms for how the immune system works. It is because of this discovery that we know why transplants reject, how vaccines work, and most recently, how the immune system can be harnessed to kill rogue cancer cells. Peter came from Brisbane and went to school up the road from where I lived. There's a, there's a trend here of Brisbane uh, scientists. But he originally trained as a veterinary science, and in fact, a lot of famous immunologists were trained as vets. Um, he went on to do his PhD at Edinburgh, followed by undertaking his Nobel Prize winning research at the John Curtin School of Medical Research at the ANU in Canberra. Uh, he then went on to uh, run a group at St. Jude's. Now he's back at the University of Melbourne, but an emeritus professor, um, most recently touring the Melbourne Writers' Festival in Byron Bay. He's written four books, tweets prolifically. You can uh, tweet during the seminar, and he's at Prof PC Doherty. He's a strong advocate for science, vaccination, the environment, and just good common sense. Peter, thank you for taking the time to speak to our students and the greater WeHi community today. Well, th thanks very much. Um, this is going to be kind of a rambly talk. I'm going to talk a bit about my career, um, show a bit of science, nothing very new, and, uh, and, uh, and finish promptly. Um, I, I was trying to think back when I, the first seminar I gave at the Hall Institute was, I think, 38 years ago, before most of you were born. And the Hall Institute at that stage was over in, uh, in space that's now occupied by Royal Melbourne Hospital. So the two big buildings, uh, one was built in 80, 1985 and, of course, one more recently. So... Um, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm old. I was born in 1940. I've just been at the Byron Bay Writers' Festival. Uh, I think I was the second oldest person speaking. The oldest was Tom Keneally, who has much better credentials at writer festivals than I do. So my whole career has basically been concerned with studying uh, the nature of infectious disease, particularly pathogenesis, immunopathogenesis of infections. I've worked with a whole spectrum of different viruses. So just thinking about it this morning, I've, I've done experiments with flaviviruses, lentiviruses, myxoviruses, paramyxoviruses, poxviruses, herpes viruses, and probably some viruses I didn't know were in the mix anyway that were sort of just hiding there. And uh, so what sort of brings that together as a sort of theme? Well, basically the theme is host response. My interest, though I've worked with a number of virus uh, infections and a number of virus models, is in the nature of host response. I trained initially as a pathologist, but I'm best known, uh, of course, for work in immunity. Immunity, as we know, immunity really, the immune system, at least I think the immune system evolved, or the adaptive immune system that, we, that I've studied, evolved to deal with infection. And immunis, immunity comes from the word immunis, which of course means without tax, uh, describes Roman soldiers, soldiers in the Roman state, who for a time were exempt from tax. Um, a common sort of uh, uh, trend of the political right today to exempt uh, people from tax. But uh, um, I, I just heard that Donald Trump's going to abolish all taxes, I think it is, except for the very, very rich. And uh, the tax that the immune system seeks to defeat is, cause, of course, the tax of infection, the tax of being parasitized with very simple, uh, rapidly replicating life forms that can evolve much more rapidly than we can. So my interest in that initially was in pathology. Uh, I started out, as was mentioned, uh, I took a veterinary science degree right at the beginning of my career. Um, I was 17 years old when I went to the vet school. If I'd been 18 years old, I probably wouldn't have gone to the vet school. If I'd been through an American college, I wouldn't have gone to the vet school. But uh, chance determines all our lives. And I went to study veterinary science because um, 
I was kind of interested in medical areas and so forth, but I didn't want to spend all my life around sick people because I thought they were pretty pretty pathetic to be spending your life around. And, <laughs> and you know, I showed all the, uh, all the EQ, the, um, the, the, the uh, emotional uh, capacity that one expects of a 17-year-old boy, which means zero, and, um, uh, and went off to the vet school uh, to try and improve. I was very altruistic. I sort of had a Methodist upbringing. And... Um, to try and improve, like Hillary Clinton, and uh, try and improve food security for the world. I wanted to feed the world. When I think about it, it was back at the time of the Club of Rome. So we were talking a lot about those sorts of issues, and I must, I must have caught that from there, I, I believe. And um, strangely enough, that's just come full circle because I've been this weekend at the Byron Bay Writers' Festival where I was on a panel uh, with uh, former Deputy Prime Minister Tim Fisher, who, uh, and we were talking about food security, the problem of feeding the world. Uh, when I first started talking more generally about food, which was after the Nobel Prize, we, we, would, we were saying, well, there are 800 million people in the world who don't get enough to eat each day. Now we've got a billion people in the world who don't get enough to eat each day, and yet at the same time we've got a uh, pandemic of obesity. So it's really uh, quite an extraordinary situation. I went through the vet school, very undistinguished career as a, as a student, um, was basically bored with veterinary medicine. I enjoyed the basic science part of it, and fortunately that was taught in the, um, in, in the science faculty, so I got a reasonably good science training. And vets at that stage uh, studied subjects that medical students had never heard of, like statistics and genetics. And, um, and so we got a reasonably good rounding in population genetics. Uh, but this is about the time of, uh, of, of uh, Watson and Crick's initial, initial paper, or a bit after, so we weren't very aware of molecular science. I went through uh, the university on a scholarship that required me to work as a veterinary officer for the Queensland government for five years. That was the way they got doctors and vets and dentists to go to the rural areas. They kind of indentured them. And a lot of us, uh, quite a number of people who've made reasonably good scientific careers after having that initial period period out in the bush somewhere as a resident medical officer or something of that sort. And when you talk to them, they look back on that and they think that was a fantastic experience. And I was in the bush for a while, but they, I rapidly, they rapidly realised I was far too dangerous to leave in the country. So they brought me back to the laboratory and I worked in the, uh, in the state diagnostic lab where I did some research on leptospirosis in cattle. And uh, that was my first... Uh, that's the uh, kidney of a cow, if you're wondering what the disgusting looking object is. And uh, it's a kidney disease, of course. And uh, uh, it was a crazy, crazy, crazy uh, set of experiments. Um, but, um, but that was the first stuff I wrote. Uh, my first research paper was in the Australian Veterinary Journal. So I started at the, at the beginning and, and have worked up a little bit since then. I'm up, I, I think I've now had a paper in immunology and cell biology, for instance. Um, I... Uh, when I was, I, I really wanted to do research and it really wasn't possible to do serious research in an environment like that. I came down to Melbourne, they, they sent me down to Melbourne to learn some virology, diagnostic virology, uh, which I found to be actually pretty boring. It's now much more interesting with deep sequencing and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I applied for a job that was advertised in the back of Nature. This is the time of snail mail, of course. You wrote letters and you got letters back. And they were advertising they wanted an, an experimental neuropathologist to work on uh, diseases of the brains of sheep. You might think that sheep don't have much of a brain, but they do have some very import, economically important diseases. Scrapey, the prototype prion disease, is, of course, a disease of sheep. And it had been studied at this institute, the Morden Research Institute in Edinburgh, uh, which is this place here, uh, for a very long time. They were the original people, and they were doing actually some very nice genetic studies uh, at the uh, near, nearby uh, Genetics uh, Institute on, uh, in, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, anyway, they, they said they wanted an, an experienced veterinary neuropathologist, must have senior credentials, and I wrote off and said, uh, look, I don't know anything, I've never done anything, um, I, um, I'm kind of interested in doing a PhD at Edinburgh University, and I'd heard that I could work at this place and do a PhD, and they said come immediately because nobody had applied for the job. So I, <laughs> I, um, we got on a very slow ship uh, that's, and very cheap, 
ship that sailed off to England. Uh, largely all the way across we ate turkey because they bought up the whole excess turkey uh, supply from American Thanksgiving. And uh, we finally got to England and uh, caught the flying Scotsman up to Scotland and I started my uh, Scottish career. Um, so I, um, I found quickly that I couldn't actually enrol at the University of Edinburgh as a full-time PhD student without paying a lot of money. So I, uh, I was working as a senior scientific officer in the British civil servants. That was my job, doing some diagnostic neuropathology and also supposed to do research. So I enrolled as an external part-time student at the University of Edinburgh. And that's how I did my PhD. It took me three years. Uh, I used to go and see my supervisor, Professor Montgomery, once a year and I would tell him what I was doing, and he was an old uh, medical pathologist, very nice man, and I'd tell him what I was doing, and he would say, well, that's very interesting. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we, we didn't have a lot of common ground. So I'm telling, you, I'm telling you all this because I'm telling you, firstly, I was a lousy student as an undergraduate. Uh, in the last two years, I think I played a lot of cards and drank beer, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I wasn't even a full-time student and I never had a real supervisor or a real mentor, and I would have been a lot better scientist if I had, but, you know, that's how, that's how it happens. Uh, then, uh, after, after five years in Edinburgh, I decided, we decided we should come back to Australia, and uh, I got a job at the... I, I got a postdoctoral fellowship at the, um, at the old uh, John Curtin School of Medical Research. This is the old building. It's the only building of the John, original John Curtin that still stands and uh, uh, in the microbiology department. That was headed at the time by Gordon Ada, who'd come up from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute with Fr when Frank Fenner retired. Frank was, um, was Mac Burnett's PhD student, or student way back and did very important work. Uh, Fenner had come there as first chair of microbiology and uh, I think at about the age of about 34 or 35. Uh, jobs were a bit easier to get then, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and then he was followed by Gordon. At that stage, Frank was the director. And I worked there for three and a half years, and that's when Rolf Zinkenagel came along. Uh, we were working with lymphocytic meningitis virus, which is a um, very interesting pathogen. And uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty primitive, actually. The, the building had air conditioning, but it was never turned on because when they first constructed the building, uh, the air conditioning just blew through a big fan and blew everything off the desks. Uh, shortly afterwards, the man who actually built the building left the country very quickly. <laughs> and uh, uh, The biohazard hood we had, for instance, we were working with a virus that can kill you or can make you very sick, lymphocytic choromeningitis virus. The biohazard hood uh, uh, was actually an old fume hood uh, chemical fume hood, and Fenner had invented a, a biohazard hood by putting uh, electric radiator bars alternately up the spout of the fume hood. So the idea was you'd turn these on, they'd heat up, and they would convect the air in and out. Well, of course, if you made a mistake and thought it was a fume hood and put a bottle of chloroform open in there or something, the whole building would have blown up. And so uh, they disconnected them all. And uh, Rolf and I reconnected them, and, uh, and, and we did our experiments, and that's where we made the big discovery. I then went to the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia and then came back again to, uh, um, to, to the John Curtin School as a professor, uh, stayed about five years, and, uh, and then went back to St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis, where I'm just, uh, I've ha still had some sort of appointment, even though I've been largely back here for the last 14 years, and I'm now just going emeritus in St. Jude. I'm still three days a week uh, employed at the University of Melbourne. Uh, my second uh, experience at the University of Melbourne was well described by a quote I heard earlier. Um, if, you, if you want to reform, uh, if you want to climb the mountain of reforming a university, be prepared that it's the hill you're going to die on. Um, <laughs> I went from Canberra to Memphis as a result of that type of activity, and I've never tried to reform anything since. So while I was in Edinburgh, my first, I think my first significant discovery was uh, at working as a pathologist. I was working, uh, doing electron microscopy pathology and uh, collaborating with another young guy who was doing the virology and, and antibody responses and so forth. And the first interesting thing I think uh, that I ever found 
was that antibody forming cells, plasma blasts, actually localize in the brain in virus infections of the central nervous system. And they sit there for a long time and they pump out quite a lot of antibody. That uh, hadn't been shown formally before, though I've been suspected. And what the picture you can actually see there is actually plasma blasts going through the vasculature into the central nervous system. And then they sit there and, uh, and make antibodies. So uh, that, um, the fact of antibody being in cerebrospinal fluid at high levels had caused a lot of confusion, particularly as people tried to work out multiple sclerosis because they thought that the fact that antibodies to something or other were in the brain reflected that, they, uh, that this was a cause, but not necessarily so. These plasma blasts will also go into brain uh, uh, spontaneously without uh, necessarily having an infection there. So I worked for sheep uh, for years, and then I switched to, uh, to lab mice when I came back to the John Curtin School. And the MHC restriction discovery we made, of course, was done with mice. Uh, so I, I switched from being a vet to being an MD, a mouse doctor, and uh, have been, for most of my career, have done that. And of course, our, our key research and our research over the years has largely been with the killer T cell response. <laughs> Uh, the CD8 T cell response. We have done other things, uh, uh, particularly at St. Jude. We are doing quite a bit on single cell antibody uh, uh, using LE spots and that sort of thing, CD4 T cell response. But my true passion is the killer T cell. And if you think of the killer T cell in terms of the immunus model, he's like the, the gladiator, the, uh, the Roman foot soldier. And the Roman foot soldier um, was their weaponry was they had this big shield, killer T cells don't kill themselves, and, and they carried a very short stabbing sword called the, the, the gladius. And, uh, and they, they were sort of fighting the Scotsman or whatever who'd come around wielding these big, big swords. They would all get their shields up, and then when the, when the guy got up close with his big swords, they'd poke him in the tummy. And that's basically uh, the way the killer T cell works. It, um, it, has, uh, it has to make contact, with its target cell, it delivers uh, um, molecules at close at, at, at the interface, and, and then uh, you get basically apoptotic cell suicide of the of the target cell. Um, and uh, it's got a couple of different mechanisms, as does the uh, as does the Roman soldier. The, he also carries a dagger called the pugia. Uh, the NKT cell that's just an immunological joke, and like all immunological jokes, it's not it's not. <laughs> It's not funny at all, and uh, though, though, though Dale Godfrey did point out that I'm a co-author on a paper with him. Um, yeah, and this is, uh, this is, everyone knows Misty, and um, who's now firmly ensconced here, and this is some of her, one of her wonderful movies, if I can get it to go. Yeah, there we are. The green tea cell coming along and zapping the... There we are. That's the best part of the whole talk, and you could have had Misty give you that one, and she'd give you a lot more stuff and a lot more nice, nice movies. And, uh, oh, I've still got the B cells up there. I've used the B cells over there as invading T cells, so, you know, some of this is a lie. And, uh, and of course, as we all know, the killer T cell recognises peptide in the groove of the MHC glycoprotein. Um, and um, our contribution to this was the initial discovery that, um, oh, and of course, we, as we now know, that type of response, the killer T cell response, is being used very successfully in some, some cancer therapies that, that uh, by uh, uh, working through the uh, targeting immune checkpoint inhibitors, we're waking up the T cells that we, all, we knew for a very long time were sitting around in tumours and not doing anything. This was a lot of research over the years where people tried taking these cells out, they tried culturing them, they tried reinfusing them. Uh, nothing ever worked particularly well, but the uh, PD-1 and CTLA-4 blockade has worked. Uh, PD-1 uh, not as um, damaging as the CTLA-4, and of course this is now a major uh, feature of cancer, cancer therapy. Uh, it doesn't work with everybody, but it does work with some. And uh, it's still being explored for the range of tumours that can actually be affected. So the killer T cells that we sort of helped define way back in the 1970s um, are now actually, have actually come into the therapeutic arena. So when you think about that, that's taken, uh, taken 35, 40 years 
to actually bring them from that initial finding and then from the subsequent discoveries that were made, particularly by Jim Allison, who worked uh, so hard with CTLA-4, uh, that uh, we now have actually some, uh, some clinical use. Um, this is what we found early on. We found that the killer T cells would only kill histocompatible, H2-compatible target cells uh, that were virus-infected, and we proposed that the T cells were recognising something, some form of altered self. We had two arguments, one there were two T cell receptors, one for the MHC and one for the virus, and the other argument there's some sort of altered self. We didn't understand the nature of the altered self, and it was 10 years later that Alan Townsend came along and told us that it was actually a peptide that was processed in the cytoplasmic compartment. And at about the same time, we saw the first pictures of the MHC uh, made, by, um, made from the, uh, the Harvard group and, uh, and showing... Um, um, a, a smear in the groove uh, of the MHC molecule, which was undoubtedly the peptide, and of course it's all gone from there. By 1996, uh, the year what, that we got the Nobel Prize, Ian Wilson published the first pictures of uh, the T-cell receptor peptide MHC complex. They were the first, uh, co one of the first, comp one of the early complexes of proteins, I think, that was published. Um, the earlier, an earlier one was, of course, the, the neuraminidase antibody one, which led uh, the Australian group to identifying the, uh, uh, um, the target for, uh, for the neuraminidase inhibitor drugs. And anyway, so this was very, very, uh, very, very primitive stuff. And of course, the real biochemists regarded diagrams like that as, uh, as, as pretty weak, which they were. But at that stage, uh, we had none of the technology we had today. We didn't have monoclonal antibodies. We didn't have recombinant DNA technology. Uh, protein sequencing, if you wanted to sequence uh, something where you could get buckets of it, like uh, myoglobin or something, that was fine. And uh, also the structural work with those molecules was done early on. But um, you couldn't really get very much molecule off a cell surface. And that people worked really, really hard. People like... Uh, Stan Nathanson worked really hard to get enough protein off cell surface to actually, I think by about 1978, we had about the first 20, 30 amino acids of H2 sequenced. Now, of course, we sequence through everything with enormous rapidity because of PCR and all the rest. So it was really very primitive times and, and, and kind of an anti-diluvian era. I think of myself as part of the living fossil record of immunology, and I think that's fair enough. Uh, the reason we were able to make a big hit quickly is because we found this effect with the cytotoxic T cell response that the killer T cell would only kill a histocompatible virus infected target cell. The reason we were able to work that out fast and to, to sort out exactly what was happening is that a whole lot of my, mouse strains have been made uh, in the lineage of George Snell. There were various people who, apart from Snell, who were doing this, but basically Snell, who'd set out to study um, cancer by using, uh, or immune responses to cancer in the 1930s, by taking mice where he painted methylcholanthrene on the skin, tra got transformed tumours and then was transferring the tumours, found they were very quickly rejected, but realised very rapidly it wasn't an immune response directed at the cancer, it was an immune response directed at the mouse from which he transplanted the tumour cells. And Snell had then gone about doing classical backcrossing and genetics to actually isolate the loci that were, were involved. And he defined the strong transplantation loci in the mouse, the K and the D, and then the L locus. And, uh, of course, others had been describing what were then called the immune response gene loci. So Snell really defined the class 1 loci, and, uh, and others were defining the class 2, uh, people like Don Schreffler and, uh, and so forth. And, um, and it was getting those mouse strains that allowed us to map this effect very quickly to the strong transplantation antigen. And no biological effect other than transplantation had at that stage been mapped to the strong transplantation molecules. And so people understood that the transplant response was very strong, but nobody understood why we had a transplant response. And it was called histocompatibility or foreign uh, allograft response and all the rest of it. And what we actually showed is that the strong, so-called strong transplantation molecules are actually the self-monitoring molecules that are used by the immune system to check 
that a cell is not modified in a way that's dangerous, either by virus or, or, or cancer or what else. So if it hadn't been for the work that these guys did, our, our paper would have been probably pretty obscure because we couldn't have sorted it out properly. The other thing to, to realise about this is it was sorted out in mice. You could not have done that experiment and, and come to those conclusions with humans, with the state of the art of the technology. It would be, that's just have been impossible. And the people who are trying to, to work with these types of systems with humans just made an enormous mess. And, uh, and, and this cleared it up. Though, of course, they were very, you know, when you've been working on something for 30 years and someone tells you what, it's, what you've been working on and it's two young guys that nobody's ever heard of, uh, they don't necessarily like that very much. And, uh, um, but, so what? Uh, anyway, so something like 20 years later, we got the Nobel Prize um, in 1996. That was actually uh, 100 years after the death of Alfred Nobel. And um, that's the lineup on the stage. Uh, the first three in the Nobel lineup um, are always the physicists. That's how Nobel sort of mandated it should be because he thought they were the smartest people on Earth. And of course, <laughs> of course they know they're the smartest people on Earth. And they probably are. And uh, now they all do informatics. And um, uh, then there's the chemists. There's this, these were the buckyball chemists. Then there's me and Zinkenagel, and it's a Polish poet, and then the economics prize, Jim Merlis. And I've just, we've just been at Jim's 80th birthday. So um, after the Nobel Prize, you don't get any more awards. That's it. <laughs> um, and, and, the reason, and the reason is the other awards are all trying to predict the Nobel Prize. The, the Lasker Award, the big medical research prize in, um, in the US, is uh, it, about half the people who win the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, about half the people who win the Lasker Basic Science Award go on to win the Nobel Prize. We won the Lasker Basic Science Award in 1995, but I'm from Queensland, so I was telling myself that half the people who win the Lasker Award don't win the Nobel Prize because, you, you know, Queenslanders don't have very high expectations. And, um, and though we, we, we have caused a considerable blight on the Australian people with the election of two National Party senators. <laughs> and, um, and, but you do get your picture painted. Uh, this, is, uh, this is at St Jude, where I was working at the time. It's actually uh, an institution run by... Uh, the, it's funded by, with an enormous fundraising campaign, by Lebanese American Catholics. And, uh, and um, it's the only picture, I think, that makes me look vaguely Lebanese. But um, <laughs> this, is, this is the Australian portrait, uh, which is in the National Gallery, done by Rick Amor. Rick normally uh, paints decrepit industrial landscapes. And uh, <laughs> that's how I look at breakfast. And, uh, I, I caught, uh, uh, my wife tells me, or how I used to look, but I look worse than that now. And, um, and then we, uh, of course, we got on a stamp. I mean, I think the stamp had, it had Nancy Millis, a wonderful lady who died recently, one of the first women professors at University of Melbourne, a fantastic person who told the most filthy jokes. And uh, <laughs> even when she looked like that, you know, this little old granny, he'd come out with this absolutely disgusting joke. It was great. <laughs> she was great. And we all loved her. And, uh, and, and Gus was on a stamp and Don was on a stamp and uh, God knows who else. Yeah, I'm sure. And uh, now, of course, you know, if you go to the Olympic Games, I don't know whether they still do it because nobody uses stamps anymore, but if you go to the Olympic Games, uh, they photograph you before you go away, and if you win a gold medal, you're on a stamp the next day, but uh, I don't know whether that still happens. And you get honorary degrees, and uh, this is getting an honorary degree in, in, uh, in Central Europe, and much to our surprise, they dressed us up like medieval monks. <laughs> And there are two lessons from this. One, one thing is you can see why there's never been an Irish Pope. You, you know, if you've got sticky out ears, you can't wear one of those hats and look OK. You need one of those square faces with small ears. And, uh, and, and the other thing it tells you is men have no idea what to do with flowers. <laughs> because they... You know, if you go to a lot of Asian cultures, uh, people give you flowers, 
and it's very nice. It's, it's, and, and, but there's always a handoff, you know. Uh, here's the flowers. Thanks. Handoff. Uh, there's a nice lady. There was no handoff. And, and, and so we got stuck with these flowers. And I didn't even realise we had them, but this, this picture surfaced a couple of years later, actually. And, and you can see we're both standing there wanting to throw the flowers away. And, <laughs> And we're holding them in front of our crotch for some reason. So, so I don't know. There's, uh, women can tell you why that is. But I mean, if you give a woman flowers, she smells them, appreciates them. We just want to get rid of them. And, and uh, I've had a, a street named after me in my hometown, apart from a building across the street. Uh, the building in the background is Bogger Road Jail. Um, <laughs> and I do have an Irish name, though. I was brought up a Methodist. And, the Brisbane of my childhood was about as divided as, uh, as the Shankill Road in Belfast, quite frankly. Um, so immune responses. As we all know, immune responses work through having very small numbers of precursors that can recognise uh, whatever it is, whether it be part of a protein, classically in an antibody response, or, or, or some modification of uh, either class 1 or class 2 molecules on cell surface in the T-cell response. Um, Quite a bit of diversity in the numbers of the types of the numbers of receptors that can recognise a particular change, particularly in the T cell response, as we found uh, uh, when we went into that in in some depth. And uh, those small numbers of precursors recognise the modified dendritic cell, and then with with T cell help from the CD4 response, if we're talking about the CD8s or the antibody response, we get clonal expansion and differentiation till we get an effector cell, whether the effector cell is a plasma blast and then a plasma cell that secretes antibody and will do so for a very long time. We know of, of antibody responses to, um, to yellow fever virus, which is given only once as an effective virus. Uh, people in the Western world don't contact yellow fever. Uh, but many people in my generation particularly were vaccinated against it. And if you go to Africa, you should still be vaccinated against it if you're going to West Africa. And, um, and those antibody response, antibody specific clones or the plasma cells or the plasma busts or whatever, we know can continue to be around for 50 years. So long memory is very, very long term. We also have uh, experiments from uh, yellow fever vaccination, from vaccinia exposure in the old days when people used to get smallpox vaccine, that, uh, that T cells can be around for a very, very long time again. Uh, again, T cell clones, that is, T cell lineages. Uh, though we don't know tremendous, we don't know tremendous about about these lineages. Though the techniques are actually there to study them, so we get clonal expansion, differentiation to affect a function. Uh, classically, in an acute virus infection like influenza, um, the antibody response, the killer T cell response, uh, and mostly with these infections, various elements of response work together. They do different things, but they achieve the goal of eliminating the pathogen. And uh, once the pathogen's eliminated, uh, classically, say, influenza in the lung, which is a localised infection, killer T cells come in. They can zap the virus-infected cells and stop the infection by themselves, pretty much. Uh, or antibody can also stop the infection uh, and, uh, and, and eliminate the virus-infected cells in the end, though it does that less quickly than the killer T cell response. Um, once that's done and the, and, the, and the infection is gone, and then you lose a lot of the cells, they die, and you get long-term memory and persistence of memory cells in the very long term. Uh, the memory cell can be recalled to affect a function more quickly, and there are more of them. Phenotypically, they're different, and in a molecular sense, they're different too. So you have this, this great system where you have cells that go from between different functional states, you have the naive cell, the cell you start out with, say, we'll talk only now in terms of CD8 T cell, the T cell that comes out of the thymus. Uh, you have clonal expansion to give you your effector cells. You also have clonal expansion to give you your memory cells. There's an ongoing debate about whether the, the memory cells come from that clonal expansion but don't go through the effector phase or whether some of them go through the effector phase and, uh, and, and, uh, and then, then de-differentiate, if you like. I'm kind of of the, of the mind that probably they're, they're different, but, uh, but uh, that's not really worked out. And so then they'll hang around for a very long time. And I, as far as uh, 
I'm concerned they probably hang around in the absence of antigen stimulation and are just maintained by physiological mechanisms in the long term. Numbers fall, and uh, uh, particularly with humans, where as we, we do with time lose some memory, uh, boosting is a good thing to do, um, particularly with uh, vaccines. So having, uh, with the CD8 T cell response, we can actually enumerate individual T cells in a response, and we can quantify it. And so that allows us to really start to address some of, some of the big questions in biology. And I thought for a long time, we've known for a while since we got the tetramers that allowed us to uh, quantitate and, and sort CD8 T cells, that we could get very good measurements of T cell numbers. And so that allows us to look at things like homeostasis, population sizes, and all the rest of it. We only started to do that in 1998. In 1996, I got the Nobel Prize for the killer T cell response. That's 20 years ago. Uh, but we didn't have good numbers on T cells. We had, our numbers were actually far too low because we didn't have the right technology. And of course, that's how a lot of science advances, is we, we understand better as we get better technology. And that's, of course, what drives a lot of science. Not, um, not, not sometimes, but not, of, not that often, in fact. It's, it's not so much a, a fantastic intellectual insight at the point of view of forming a hypothesis. Intellectual insight often comes when you try to understand your data set. And uh, that's why, in a sense, the, uh, uh, the scientific paper is a bit fraudulent because we don't really introduce a scientific paper saying why we did the experiment if the experiment doesn't give us the result we want. We tend to go back from the data and, and you write your data first you put out your tables, you analyse it, you look at your results, then you write the discussion, then you uh, write the introduction, and the very last thing you write is the abstract, or maybe the last thing you write is the introduction to introduce the results you got. Now, in a sense, that's not, not totally true. The philosophers would like us to lay out every intellectual step we make, but that would make a paper so boring and so confusing that nobody would, uh, would ever publish it. I mean, the last thing you want to do to a reviewer is put up front the, the question, this question, and then not answer it, okay? <laughs> because your paper won't go anywhere. And, um, and anyway, so that, that is, uh, is one thing that we, through the CD8 T cell response, we can get fantastic numbers. Now, of course, there are a lot of challenges in understanding the homeostatic control of immune, immune cell populations. Uh, if, you if you think in terms of a liver or a brain, I mean, a brain can only grow so big because it's in a tight box. If your brain kept growing, you'd be in real trouble, okay, once you've got a formed skull. And in fact, also, when we're talking about immunological memory, we're talking about clonal expansion, and then we do get some contraction, but the number of clones are expanded. Now, if every time you had a thought, even, even a non-thought by watching commercial TV, if every time something occurred to you, and you had clonal expansion, you would get fantastic headaches because uh, there's no room for the brain to expand. And one of the things that, that can kill you, of course, is brain swelling. So we can't have that. So what maintains the homeostatic control of the immune system, where, uh, particularly the T cell response? Much of the time with the T cell response, we don't even know how many T cells we've got. Part of the reason is some of them are in the, in the lymphoid tissue, some of them are in the blood, some of them are in, in tissues, and we don't know how quickly they're moving in and out. We don't know much about rates. So we know something about cytokines and so forth that will maintain some sort of homeostatic status, but it's still an area that's not that well understood. And maybe it's an area that can't, can only really be understood uh, through modelling type approaches because the experiments aren't that, uh, aren't that accessible. But still, it's a great system for studying it. And, and of course, we do know that the immune system the numbers of immune cells can be massively expanded to the, to the extent that make us, makes us sick and can stay that way for a time. And the disease that tells us that is infectious mononucleosis, Epstein-Barr virus, when you initially catch it, you get these enormous numbers of white blood cells uh, that eventually go down. And while you've got all those white blood cells around pumping out all sorts of nasty stuff, you feel pretty rotten and you don't pass your exams. And so um, differentiation... Well, the fact that we can take one lineage of cells and we can now identify lineages of cells either through making T cell receptor transgenics or through understanding the T cell receptors that are generated naturally in immune response, the fact that we can go from naive to effector, 
maybe to memory or maybe they're different lineages, means that we can now isolate those different differentiation states because of various cell surface markers and so forth and, and then study what it is that they, they are doing in a molecular sense. And, of course, that's led to uh, a lot of focus in, uh, on, on epigenetic profiles, what's happening at the level of transcriptional control and all the rest of it. And that's really a very exciting area, but unless you're actually doing it, uh, it's pretty hard to keep it in your head, and there's not much that stays in my head anymore anyway. So. And then the other question with, um, with viral immunity or with cancer immunity or anything else like that is the question of protection. So though it's not a central intellectual question, it's the question we all want to answer, is how do we best protect ourselves against infections or cancers or any of the rest of it? Well, the experiments I'm, I'm going, to, going to run through quickly are all done with the influenza A viruses. They're rapidly replicating viruses. They change a lot in molecular sense because of the mutation in the cell surface glycoproteins. And the uh, T cell recognition, this is in the B6 mouse, is largely directed at a few peptides from largely internal and relatively conserved <laughs> proteins. That means one of the interests we've had in the T cell response is in that cross-reactive response, whether we could use that to handle, say, rapidly replicating viruses that change by mutation very quickly. There was a big push in the HIV field, for example, to say that we should be able to make T cell vaccines because even though the cell surface molecules under antibody-mediated selection change very quickly in the persistent HIV infection, the T cell response is often relatively conserved to peptides from internal proteins. And, of course, that, that gave the thinking that we could actually handle this by, uh, by vaccinating or by priming the CD8 T cell response. I used to go to scientific meetings and say it won't work because uh, the problem is it takes time to turn those CD8 T cells back on again. And by that time, HIV will have got in and will have escaped. And as a result of that, they stopped asking me to the meeting. But... Um, <laughs> That's perfectly reasonable. And, of course, we, we can enumerate these, um, uh, these CD8 T cells with tetrameric complexes of the class 1 MHC molecule and peptide, which will then bind to the T cell receptor, uh, a, a technique that was developed by John Altman and Mark Davis's lab. This totally revolutionised T cell immunology. Um, so... I won't go on, on about it. I mean, that's a classical T cell response, primary response, secondary response, eliminating the virus. Uh, we've studied these at the level of T cell receptor expression for both the alpha and beta chain using single cell T cell sorting and RT PCR. We've been able to trace clonal lineages through and uh, how they're coming up again in, in uh, secondary responses. And uh, that's, that means we can actually follow clonotypes and, and really identify them very, uh, very easily. Um, with the alpha chain of the T cell receptor, you, you get a lot of uh, aberrant um, uh, message that sort of hangs around, and you can actually use those as markers for T cell clones. Uh, very little has been done with this technology in humans, which is where it would be most usefully applied. Uh, we've done a little bit with CMV, but it would be great to see more studies of what happens with clonal, lin clonal lineages in the very long term in humans. And, uh, and maybe uh, uh, we're doing a bit more of that now, and we hope to do a bit more of that with influenza as we take more interest in the influenza-specific response. I mean, one of the problems with influenza vaccines and influenza immunity in general is that they don't, the vaccines don't very, work very well in the elderly, and, of course, the immune, uh, immune system falls off anyway with age. Now, um, various questions, I've, I've talked for too long about other things, various questions about different specificities. We have immunodominant responses in CD8 T cells. We have subdominant responses. We don't really quite understand why that is, whether it's due to antigen load, whether it's due to T cell receptor, MHC avidity. It's somewhere in that sort of area, but it's not really very well defined what determines the nature of an immune response. And we have some populations, for instance, which we'll give very good primary responses and very, very poor memory. So there's a whole lot of area out there we understand very, very poorly. There's a lot of got work going on between, for instance, Catherine Kidzieska's lab, Nicole de Grew's lab and Jamie Rostjohn's uh, uh, group uh, doing um, 
the TCR, uh, peptide MHC interactions at the structural level to try and understand this better. What we think is that basically uh, the magnitude of a response is really determined by, the, by both the frequency of precursors, though that's not the sole determinant, uh, the precursors in the naive compartment, and also the, the recruitment of those cells into lymphoid tissue and the duration of clonal expansion. That kind of makes sense, but it's not really been formally shown. Um, going back to our killers, uh, which I won't bother turning it on again. Um, we get the acute effector phase and then memory. Um, you get all these molecules that are involved in the killer pathway, uh, granzymes, the serine esterases, perforin, all the rest of it. Um, Misty Jenkins' experiments in the lab showed uh, that basically these um, effector molecules at the level of message using single cell PCR are turned on pretty randomly. Uh, though the, long, the more you get towards the effector phase, the more of them you get turned on. They're never, uh, pretty much they're never all turned on though, which is kind of intriguing. And then it's all, you can also show that both the cytotoxic activity and the expression of the effect of mo molecules is directly related to cell division. So as the cells divide and proliferate during the, during the primary or secondary response, you turn on these effect of molecules and you make your killer T cells. And then uh, when you get into long-term uh, immunological memory, uh, then, then some of them still remain reasonably turned on at the message level, which is again interesting. Um, so... Epigenetic responses, uh, Steve Turner, and uh, Steve's just moved to uh, Monash as chair of microbiology. He's focusing extremely, uh, uh, concentrating very much on this. And uh, if you haven't heard him talk, he's, it's, uh, he's getting some absolutely fascinating stuff. I guess the stuff going on at the Weehai and in various places, uh, Ben Youngblood at St Jude and, and so on. So this is really a very dynamic area of research at the moment and we're starting, uh, I think, to understand uh, some of the profiles that really define the different differentiation states in these, uh, these killer T cell lineages. And um, on a more practical front, um, if you look at the infection itself, uh, this, these are mouse experiments. If you set up immunological memory, uh, this is what you see. This is a primary response where you're taking tetramer-positive CD8 T cells out of the lung of a mouse with influenza. This is a very old slide, um, done way back, just after we got the tetramers. And you can see that the cells coming into the bronchoalveolar lavage, the cells you can wash out of the infected lung of a mouse with influenza, uh, first appear about day seven after infection, and by about day 10, they're present in large numbers. Virus is eliminated between day seven and day 10. And if you take out the antibody response by using, a, say, a mu -MT mouse or something, you can still eliminate the virus. Um, then this is a mouse that was primed, primed by uh, peripheral injection, that is not into the lung, but primed by the influenza virus given intraperitoneally. You will see, and it's cross-reactive, not cross-reactive at the antibody level, so that the challenge virus is neutralised, but cross-reactive at the T-cell level. Here you can see the secondary response, and it's what I said before, that the secondary T-cells only come into the lung this is about day five. So it's still a considerable lag phase before you uh, re-energise re, uh, those cells in the lymphoid tissue and they come back into the lung. And then you'll get a massive secondary response, which is way over the top with this particular epitope, though that's not necessarily the case for other ones. Uh, the virus is eliminated about two days earlier uh, where you've got prime CD8 T cells. Now... That doesn't give you sterilising immunity, but if you use a highly virulent virus and you, you get the, the doses and everything sort of right, you can have a virus which would kill uh, the, in the primary response, which won't kill in the secondary. But it's also the case that very virulent viruses can blast right through that and kill very, very quickly. Problem with flu is the virus replicates very, very fast when it first gets in. Uh, it's so infectious because we, we are highly infectious before we realise we've got the infection and it makes it very hard to either uh, to use therapy, for instance. If you use antiviral therapy with influenza, you've got to give it very early and that's one of the problems of using antivirals as a, as a treatment in flu. And that's, uh, you get these massive secondary responses but, uh, but they don't necessarily help that much. And... Uh, the other factor in that equation is uh, people are now studying, of course, what happens when you've got T cells localised in a site. 
Um, um, Scott uh, Mueller's been using the herpes virus model in skin. Uh, the T cells just bounce around and uh, in the skin. Um, this is Scott's picture, if I can bring it up. No. Um, I lost the. Oh, there we are. Yeah, they just sort of bounce around, which is interesting. These are, these are localised resident memory T cells in the skin. Linda Wakim is studying this in the, uh, in the mouse lung with flu. Uh, the lung, of course, is a very delicate tissue. You can't have a lot of inflammatory cells sitting around in the very long term. So one wonders uh, how, how, um, how well, whether the resident memory will help a lot. Um, does this uh, cross-reactive, cross-protective uh, response work at all in humans? There's evidence from way back that it does. Andrew McMichael was doing experiments way back in the 19... Uh, back before HIV hit. What happened in viral immunity was a lot of the high-powered viral immunity immunologists like McMichael, uh, as soon as HIV hit, they were totally drawn across into that because it was such a catastrophe and such an acute need to actually do something about it. Andrew's recently come back to working on influenza over the last five years or so and has been doing interesting experiments. He actually did human studies, human challenge studies back then and showed some degree of protection by T cell responses. Um, um, Catherine Kiedzierska's lab has been looking at this uh, from the point of view of human infections as well. This is the uh, study they did with the uh, highly lethal H7N9 virus, which is a virus that comes across from chickens to humans but hasn't spread between humans. The re real worry with flu, these viruses do come across into humans. And the real worry is, of course, when they change in such a way that they spread between humans. This is a very virulent virus. It's, uh, it killed a number of people, particularly elderly males. And uh, you may think that's not much of a loss, but um, <laughs> it, uh, uh, and, and uh, younger people were kind of a, a bit like SARS. Uh, with SARS, the people that died were the older people, not the young people. If you've got a good, healthy, young immune system, uh, most people survived the SARS infection. It's a coronavirus, not a not a flu-type virus, but, uh, but older people uh, did die. Uh, the reason that elderly males died particularly, this was in China, it's thought that, uh, you know, the Chinese tend to live in rather small spaces, and when the, the man retires, he's stuck with the problem, or the, the wife is stuck with the problem of, of having the husband around all the time. You know, there's a bumper sticker in the United States that says retirement, half the income, twice the husband. And, uh, and basically, so what they would do is they would send them out to buy the chickens at the live bird market, which is where, um, where the Chinese like to buy uh, their poultry, not, not a, as a frozen supermarket chicken, but as a live bird. And, and then they would, uh, as a result, they were the ones getting infected because these live bird markets were a big multiplier of flu viruses. The way they've solved that, actually, for a time they tried killing everything out, and that caused a big cultural problem because of people, the way people like to eat. So what they've done is that birds are bought into the live bird market in the morning. Then any bird that's left at the end of the day is killed and processed for, for the supermarket shelves. So you don't get a continuing cycle of influenza replication in the live bird market, which is what was happening. That seems to have pretty much solved the issue, so it's a satisfactory solution. Um, what... Uh, what um, um, uh, Catherine's lab found was that um, only some HLA types will present these cross-reactive peptide epitopes. And, and just doing a, a sort of search, they found that the HLA types, which A2, which is very prevalent in Caucasians, uh, will present these key in influenza cross-reactive peptides that are shared between many, many influenza viruses. H7N9 was a virus we'd never even seen before in birds, let alone anywhere else, and suddenly it starts coming up in humans. You can't predict what these things will be. What they found is the Australian indigenous people didn't have their HLA types, which are very common in their population, didn't present these cross-reactive peptides. And that's one of the reasons we think, and it's also true of the, uh, of the Eskimo in, in, and so forth, and it's one of the reasons we think that indigenous populations across the planet have been rather suscept more susceptible to influenza than Caucasians. There's various other reasons why that might be so, but we think there may also be a genetic basis as well. They're not presenting the cross-reactive types. And when you think about 
out of the Australian indigenous population hasn't until European settlement been subject to the selective pressure of influenza uh, through a very long period. Uh, they suffered very badly at the night when the 1918-19 virus got here, and uh, they, they also had a much bigger influenza problem uh, when that 2009 swine flu virus went round. Um, Catherine's lab also found that the, from hospitalised patients, this is a wonderful collaboration we did with the group at Shanghai Hospital, uh, the, 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 um, the people who had with hospitalised patients, the people who made an early CD8 T cell response, which probably reflected established CD8 T cell memory, were the ones who survived. Um, the people who died made no response. Interestingly, what you could see is as the infection went on, you got more natural killer cells and those sorts of things dragged into the response. It's as though the, the, the host was throwing everything possible at the virus uh, because the CD8 T cell wasn't handling it. So this... Hope then. Now I'll stop talking about the science of it. Um, I'm just going to the end of this. Um, latterly, I've become much more involved in writing books. Uh, one of the things that all scientists have got to do is take themselves out of the scene. Um, Max Planck said that science advances by funerals. So uh, if you don't want the granting agencies to kill you off, you have to take yourselves out of the equation. So I've been writing books, and uh, I think... We all need to recognise that science communication is enormously important and it's something we can all do. And the way we can do it is through things like social media, by blogging, by interacting. I know some of you have probably gone, I, I think when Suzanne was director, I, don't, I guess it's probably continuing, there's been some program where postdocs have gone and talked at schools and stuff. I think all this stuff is really important and uh, we need to talk about the values of evidence and evidence-based systems and uh, to try and get that across. I can tell you it's a fairly hard slog. And, of course, uh, I guess you're all aware that the International Immunology Meeting's on in, uh, in about 10 days. So uh, I hope some of you will get along to it. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. I'm really surprised that people still ask me to give talks. Uh, uh, I've been here 22 years. I came across four seniors suffering a lot from the pneumonia, cutting off skin and then a uh, the breath of air. And so on. Uh, so I and you mentioned uh, about skin cancer. So what, what are your comments for those people who suffer so much from the pneumonia? Uh, well, um, you know, I, I grew up in Queensland. I've got this Irish complexion, and so I get basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. So I get a good dermatologist. Um, there's one across the street, actually. Um, I've, just, I've, I've just also had the kind of rather weird experience of having my whole skin surface photographed so that the dermatologist has a record of all these spots. And I'm go when I go to the dermatologist, I'm supposed to take along, I haven't got it yet, a little album with all my skin. It's something I really don't want to lose in a coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> One more question from a student. All right. Um, this question isn't entirely based on your lecture, but I was just wondering how you sort of understand some of the Yeah, my approach to mechanical systems is to try and fix them, and I never do. Uh, my wife won't let me near a washing machine that's not working. Um, we're not machines. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the thing is, a machine is a design system, okay? You, you've actually gone out, you've used engineering principles, and you've designed something, which you gradually improve as time goes by, or you gradually make worse because you want to sell more of them. Uh, it's called planned obsolescence. Uh, so, um, so basically, it's, it's a designer product. We are not designer products. I mean, the, 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 the reason that biology is so complex and we still are finding all sorts of new things and so forth is because it, though it obeys the basic laws of physics and chemistry and all the rest of it in the end analysis, the actual mechanisms it uses are based on evolutionary change. So you're building systems on pre-existing systems. So there's, no, there's not necessarily a logic to it. You wouldn't design it that way. You de it, it, so it's like building a house 
on one set of foundations, then another set, then building on top of that one, building on top of that one. So, uh, so we're not machines. Of course, sometimes we tend to think of ourselves as machines and that's kind of disastrous medically. Uh, on that note, we'd love to speak for ages, but we'll have to wrap up. Please thank Peter for an excellent presentation. <laughs>